My name is Susan McKay and I'm here with Elaine Nikulanon at her home in Dublin to talk about her distinguished and ongoing career as a poet, translator, editor and teacher. And in particular we're going to talk about St Bridget's Day and also about Elaine's new poem to market. So Elaine, first of all, can you tell us a bit about St Bridget's Day? Well, uh, it's a wonderful moment in the year because uh, it's the entry into spring. Foreigners are always astonished that we start spring <laughs> on the 1st of February, but uh, it is a, a new beginning. Uh, I always think of Raftery's poem, Anish Teach uh, the This is the beginning of spring and after St. Bridget's Day, I'm going to start and do things again. So. For everybody in the country, I think it's there. It's also a rather particular festival. It has, of course, a root in Kildare, where St. Bridget had her monastery. It's uh, connected also with farming, with the health of farm animals, with households which were protected by the St. Bridget's Cross. Uh, it's a fire festival, apparently, which goes back to pre-Christian times. and. Uh, it, there are all kinds of local customs connected with the day. So your involvement with the St Bridget's Day Creative Festival goes back to 2018, doesn't it? And it's closely bound up with your friendship with the late Leland Bardwell. Uh, can you tell us about how you came to be involved with Martina and the Hamilton Gallery on this project? Well, uh, Leland had written a poem about making Bridget's crosses, so it must have been written sometime at the, towards the end of January or maybe on St Bridget's Day. Um, and Martina had the idea of asking a number of women artists to respond to it. And there was a big exhibition in London, which I was invited to uh, be present at and say something about the paintings and also about Leland, who was a very old friend of mine. This is Leland's poem, uh, St Bridget's Day, 1989. The women's calls go up across the lake. On this still day, their voices whip the air, staccato notes behind the reed-hushed margin. Winter is writing out its past before its time, while they trail the shore, anxious to garner reeds for Bridget's cross, bending in all their different flesh shapes, like shoppers to admire a bud, an early primrose, a robin shrilly calling to its mate. Although I gather rushes like these strolling women, I'm made conscious of the decades that divide us and that I should be celebrating Bridget in her strength of fruitfulness and learning. I can only offer her the satchel of these years. I too will make a cross for luck and irony. Amongst the witches' coven, I will raise my glass so my children's children's children will gather rushes for her turning. So this, this new work that you've been doing with the Hamilton Gallery and on St Bridget's Day, um, that moves you very much into the world of visual art because it's again, as with Leland's poem, it's about how your poem was responded to by, by artists. Um, as we speak, um, there are some 19 works of art that are crossing the world by Irish uh, women who are artists and they're on their way to the Irish Embassy in Beijing where Ambassador Anne Derwin is going to welcome them as part of the St Bridget's Festival. Now, these are works from the 2020 celebration of uh, Eva Gorbuth, mm. uh, who, another great Sligo woman. In the catalogue for that exhibition, President Michael D. Higgins speaks of her as a quite extraordinary figure, not just in Ireland's revolution, but also in the international trade union suffrage and peace movements of the last century, and yet one whose memory has been somewhat obscured in Orthodox Irish historiography. Um, why, first of all, can I ask you, why do you think her memory was so obscured? Well, I think that one of the things about women poets, uh, and I, you know, I, I wouldn't say that it has come to an end, uh, is that there doesn't seem to be an ancestry. Uh, it's almost as if we have to keep inventing the wheel. Uh, and so we don't look back on the poets of earlier periods as much as we might. Uh, and I've often thought that we don't value them properly. Um, there's a wonderful poem by Eva Gora Booth, uh, Women's Trades on the Embankment, which is one of the few really good political poems that I can think of in the world. 
where she suddenly talks about uh, you know, having been told that women must have patience before they get the vote. And there's a line in it, no, oh human soul, no patience anymore. And I thought, here's somebody who's writing out of this conviction that things have to change and they have to change now, which is, uh, you know, it comes up every now and again and it is real. And I thought, how mar I mean, the whole poem is wonderful. I don't know it by heart, but there is a marvellous feeling about in, in that. And I think she's well worth resurrecting and remembering uh, as a poet, as well as a writer. President Higgins also spoke about her uncompromising ethical drive and, and her idealism. And he commented that she fought many battles, that she didn't live to see one. So that very much fits in, I think, with what, what you're talking yes. about, with women taking on that mantle without it necessarily being acknowledged that it was there for the taking. Yes, I think that's right. Can you tell us about your more recent quest to find the presence of, of St. Bridget? Well, it, it was very interesting because I had, I, I thought I'd start in Kildare because I knew that there was one there at Kildare Town and a few others sort of dotted around the place. But um, then I was talking to a friend who was brought up in Clondalkin uh, and she said, oh, there's one in, in, in Clondalkin, which is a very ordinary Dublin suburb until you get to it and see the round tower and the uh, there's a, 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 a castle not that far away from there. So it turns out to have a, a, an ancient identity. And when I asked about St. Bridget's Well, everybody knew where I was going. You know, when, you look, when you're looking for something, people don't necessarily, they often stare back at you, never heard of that. <laughs> but this was quite different. Um, so that was one place uh, that I went to. Uh, and then I had this, I overheard this rather extraordinary scrap of a conversation. And what I thought about was, um, if, you, if you look for something, you always find something slightly different. And that was what really fascinated me about this, about being on a quest. I wasn't looking for the Holy Grail. I was looking for whatever I might encounter along the way. Uh, yeah, in your introduction to the, the brochure which accompanies the exhibition um, arising from your poem, you talked about overhearing stories, phrases, parts of conversations, three women planning a wedding, a grandmother watching her grandsons jumping over a stream, and a man who pressed a bottle into your hand claiming that it had already cured him of two brain tumours, no less. Um, and you said in the poem, you said, I wrote, I couldn't cram all those details inside the boundaries. But the images that you did include included circled loosely around the image of the well and the fame of Bridget remote, but radiating power still a millennium after a millennium and a half welling up out of history. I wonder, could you actually read us that poem now? Surely. St. Bridget's Well. When I asked the way to the well, people knew what I meant, and at last I found the place. There was a tree with rosary beads and white paper twisted around the branches. I watched a girl who arrived just after me, wearing pink trousers and bright red sandals. She came in from the road. She stood and prayed and reached out, touching a stone, then moved a few feet to the right and did it all again. Just there, the path was a short cut from the road to the houses. People passed with their shopping, heading home. One woman with a child. I heard her saying to the child, walking along in her school uniform, it's for all the little babies that passed away. I wrote her words down that same evening to be sure I had the truth. It was three in the afternoon, Wednesday in the month of June. I had caught her answer to the question I didn't hear, in among the voices, the cars on the road, the soft slap of the sandals, the silent visitor wore, the children coming from school. Well, I thought, who needs apparitions? But they came anyway in spite of me, rising like steam out of a dark patch on the road, 
or more like the burning smell from a dark patch on an old door. If I wanted a map that would just show the wells, the culverted streams, the shortcuts, they came, they congregated, they insisted. What about the wall where the girls played one, two, three O'Leary, they said. I said, why do you want me to put that in? Our lovers walk, they said. I gave them back their stare. What about the swan, said I. I saw her just now in my search, so close to me, through a gap in the high wall, her head, her bending neck, white feathers of one wing. How could she nest up there and seem at ease? But when I turned to leave behind the dead end and come down again beside the factory wall, I heard the mill stream splashing downhill inside its prison pipe out of the brimming pond that I had not seen. Could I have forgotten the excess of water, the excess of all the stories I might have heard as I searched for St. Bridget's Well? Thank you, that's lovely. And that's a, that's a brand new poem, isn't it? That's especially for this uh, St. Bridget's Day celebration. Yes, indeed. Uh, I was prompted by Martina and I thought I can do this. I, I, this is something that would interest me. But then I had no idea, of course, what I would actually find. Is it your practice to converse with these apparitions? <laughs> well, I suppose the, the apparitions are partly one's readers. You know, they're, 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 sometimes they're saying, why does she write that poem instead of a different one? Um, and then there are all the people that I don't know about, but, but that I, I haven't directly heard about, but I, I know they're there. Uh, it's part of uh, any, anything where you, you try to focus on one symbol, like a well, which is a very obvious symbol. Uh, and it seems by doing that, you're removing your focus from something else. It's a bit like these uh, glasses, these multifocals, you know, where you, you're always seeing something that's out of shot. Um, just we're, we're coming to the end of our conversation now, but I just would like you to tell us about the most recent uh, poetry prize which you won. Well, uh, that was something that just came out of the blue. It was, uh, it has to do with the Munster Literature Centre, which is um, connected with various uh, places in China. Cork is twinned with Shanghai, I hope you knew that. Uh, <laughs> They, they uh, had this idea that uh, th they'd make a connection, I think, with this festival. And lo and behold, the festival came up with a prize, um, which consists uh, partly of a nice cheque, but also partly of this uh, mythical, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> bottle, uh, well, legendary, let's say, bottle of liquor, which is still uh, in Beijing being minded by my translator. I had a wonderful year corresponding with this man, Hu Wei, who was uh, writing back and forth about the poems, and I was able to see them in this new light. They brought out a book, uh, which uh, I have copies of, uh, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to think that with a place so far away that poems can reach and be changed through, of course, the skill of the translator, who uh, obviously read those poems inside and out. And really, the questions he asked were so extraordinary, they sent me back and made me think again about them. So it was a marvellous experience, even though I wasn't able to go to China and collect the bottle, but maybe I will someday. <laughs> Um, just to finish up, I'd, I'd like to ask you if you would read um, a few paragraphs from the introduction that you've written to um, the uh, brochure. Yes. Um, it's about the, the variety of images in the exhibition. How striking then to find such a plenty of images in these artists' work, which flow from the same source in all their variety and strangeness, dark with mystery or challengingly bright. I find it slightly bewildering how freshly they remind me of those two crowded 
days of my quest in Kildare, when I was passive, merely looking and listening, and astonished at how much there was to see and hear if one allowed it to happen. The artists have made something quite new in every case. They've heard an echo in the words, the echo perhaps of what was not said, and they've made images of what cannot be seen. Water is the perfect image of what can't be represented, transparent, sinking into dust and sand and soil, thirsted and sought for, but only made visible by its contexts, its courses and wells, the sky and the faces it reflects as it dissolves and submerges and changes everything. Water is like everything and nothing, and the triumph of the image maker is capturing and revealing it. Here too are hiding places and hidden secrets, dawns and twilights, and the multiplicity of light, places and their weight of history. I can only salute the fine invention and the skill that displays so many unseen mysteries. Thank you so much, Elaine, and uh, we look forward so much to saluting your future work and to enjoying the, the exhibition that accompanies you, your wonderful poem. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much.